We are in the, well, not um, formally yet. We are still technically in the first week of Advent, but tomorrow is the second Sunday of Advent. But we are celebrating our second Sunday, second week of Advent in terms of service-wise, adult service-wise today. And today we're going to be talking about the second title of the seven antiphons that we are going through. Uh, the antiphons are usually sung uh, in an evening service uh, seven days before Christmas, the last seven days of Advent, the seven titles attributed to Jesus Christ. Uh, last week we talked about O Sapienta, which is wisdom. We'll talk about O Adonai this weekend, and O Radix of Jesse, and then O Clavis of David, Key of David, and then O Orients, Day Spring, O Rex Gentium, the King of the Nations, and O Emmanuel. And these titles are given by Isaiah. Parts of it um, is found in Isaiah 11, to the one that he is expecting to come. And in English, the antiphon for Adonai would be, O Adonai, the leader of house of Israel, who appeared to Moses in the fire of the burning bush and gave him the law on Sinai, come and redeem us with an outstretched arm. Imagine that, an outstretched arm. Uh, a, a, a way of describing the Lord in the Old Testament. And never in their imagination the outstretched arm would be Jesus on the cross. What an upside down kingdom that the Jesus that we serve is ushering. Now, Adonai, of course, is the replacement word for the covenant name of God, the tetragrammaton, the four letters in the Hebrew, yod He vav He. also sometimes in English transliterated as Yahweh, the name in which no good Jew will dare to say, which sometimes I cringe when there's a contemporary song, one particularly sung by a group uh, that has the same name as the church that it belongs to, it uses the tetragrammaton in the title of the lyrics, and every time I hear it, I kind of cringe because not only because it uses the name without any concern of the context which it came from, but also how the lyrics of the song kind of just domesticated this covenant God. It's all about personal piety. But no Jew will ever dare to say the name. Instead, when they see the letters yod he vav Hey, they will either pronounce it as Hashem, or the name, or Adonai, my Lord. And in talking about the title Adonai, we're going to look at the story about Jesus that the Apostle John tells us in the gospel that he wrote. John chapter 8, verses 21 to 58, a story that took place during the Feast of Tabernacles that John began telling in John chapter 8, I'm um, John chapter 7, excuse me. And the whole text is very, very long. So we're just going to read parts of it. So I'm going to invite you to stand and let's read it together. I'm just going to, uh, we're just going to read it instead of the whole 27 verses, we're going to read parts of it. John chapter 8, the story where Jesus made the declaration of his lordship. Once more, Jesus said to them, I'm going away and you will look for me, and you will die in your sins. Where I go, you cannot come. This made the Jews ask, will he kill himself? Is that why he says, where I go, you cannot come? But he continued, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am he. You will indeed die in your sins. They did not understand that he was telling them about his father. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. If I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My Father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing the day. He saw it and said it was glad. You are not yet 50 years old, they said to him, and you have seen Abraham? 
Very truly I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. Let's pray. Help us to be immersed in the claim that the Lord Jesus made of himself. And as we are immersed in that identity of himself, Lord, will you by your spirit stamp his image in our whole being so that we will not be like the first Adam anymore, but we will be transformed and changed into the likeness of the second Adam, who also claims to be, I am he. Will you do that in his name? Amen. Please take your seats. Now, there were three feasts which every adult Jewish people living within 25 kilometers of Jerusalem were required to attend. And that is the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacle. And the Feast of Tabernacle is by far the most popular feast because it was the most joyful one. It is an eight-day celebration held in early, mid-October. And during that feast, during those eight days, the worshipers would live in small tents, Sukkoth, they call it, to remember the days when their ancestors lived in tents, when they made their way across the desert to the Promised Land. And this, in fact, is still done by Orthodox Jews. If you happen to be in a Jewish neighborhood in cities around the world, like, for example, in Williamsburg, Williamsburg Brooklyn, or parts of Vancouver where you used to live, people during the Feast of Tabernacle would still live in tents remembering this feast. Hence the name, the Feast of the Tabernacles, Sukkoth. Now, this feast is rich with symbolism, with rituals and liturgy, and the liturgy that tries to affirm their theology, affirm their understanding of who God is. And the feast is centered around a water ceremony, a light ceremony, and a festive liturgy that convey this deep message about their understanding of who God is. Now, the water ceremony is this dramatic exercise to help them recall how God miraculously provided their ancestors with water in the desert. And it also reaffirmed this great promise that one day God will pour out living water, His own Spirit, on dry and thirsty human souls. And it was on the water ceremony on the last day of the festival, this character from Nazareth, Jesus, stood up and cried, let anyone who is thirsty, and who's not thirsty, right? Let anyone who's thirsty, let anyone who's thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And then there was also a light ceremony. And the light ceremony was also this dramatic and very impressive part of the feast. It recalls the fact that when they're traveling across the desert, their ancestors never lost their way. When they, lo when they lose their way, it was because of their own deeds, not because God left them to their own devices. They never lose their way because God guided them, remember, with the pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And the light ceremony celebrated the God who guides, the God who can guide, the God who guides because he is light. This God is light. And it is during the light ceremony that Jesus stands up and says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And then there was the liturgy in the feast. And this is where Jesus also made a huge claim about himself, a very bold claim regarding himself. But before we can understand what Jesus is saying about himself, related to what is being affirmed in the liturgy, we also need to understand the liturgy in the context where it was given, in the context of the first century. Now, as I said earlier, the worshipers who came to the Feast of Tabernacles would live in small tents. They did this to remind themselves that their ancestors moved across the land, moved across the desert, living in tents. But there's also another reason why these worshipers did what they did. And that is to recall something more important. 
to recall the fact that during those days, the Lord God chose to dwell among the people, among his people, in a tent. In a tent that is called the tent of meeting, the tabernacle. You probably remember the story if you followed your yearly Bible reading, at least until Exodus. After Exodus, <laughs> from Egypt, God commanded Moses to basically raise funds. It was a building fund from the people, saying, have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Picture that, God dwelling among his people. And we find this tabernacle described to the smallest detail, created by artisans, created by craftsmen, who Moses said were spirit-filled people, which goes to show that you, know, you can be doing what you're doing in a spirit-filled way. You can be messing around with your Excel spreadsheet if you're a finance person and do it in a spirit-filled way. You can basically draw pictures as an artist and do it in such a way that is spirit-filled. And this tabernacle was to be the place where the Lord God would meet his people, his redeemed people, his recently freed people. And God says to Moses, then I will dwell among the Israelites and be their God. They will know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of Egypt so that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. And so as the Israelites travel across the desert, there was this glorious and abiding sense of the presence of God surrounding this tent of tabernacle. And so the central focus of this feast, the fundamental theological affirmation of the feast of the tabernacles, is the presence of Yahweh, the presence of Adonai, the presence of of God. The feast celebrates God's grace of wanting to dwell with his people, to manifest his glory to his people. And the feast celebrated this idea also verbally. Verbally throughout the festival of the liturgy, they would quote Old Testament texts that are used as the liturgy in this prescribed part of the feast, just like we do. For example, during Christmas season, the texts that we will read are usually from the beginning of Matthew or the beginning of Luke, right? We don't usually read during Christmas the story of the crucifixion or the resurrection. We are going to read the story that tells the Christmas story, the go-to Christmas texts. And there were also go-to texts for the Feast of the Tabernacles. And we are going to look at some of them. And I want all of us, including myself, to pay attention to how God is spoken of and how God speaks of himself. The first one is the affirmation of faith for Israel. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elohenu, Adonai Echad. The Lord is that tetragrammaton, and immediately a Hebrew would know, say, I can't say that word, I will replace it with Adonai. And then Psalm 115, verse 9 to 11. All you Israelites trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. House of Aaron, the priest, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. You who fear him, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. Did you notice the pronoun he? Did you notice that it was repeated three times? He, he, he. And then another one would be Psalm 46. They particularly paid attention to verses 4 and 5 and verse 10. It goes like this. There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break day. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Now, I hope you also notice the three times repeated pronoun, I, I, I. And then, Others with very significant importance 
were parts of Isaiah 40 to 55, which they would read throughout the service. Let me read some of it for you. Isaiah 41, verse 4. It goes, Who has done this and carried it through, calling forth the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, with the first of them, and with the last, I am He. And in Isaiah 43, verse 10, You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I've chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am He. Before me, no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. And in Isaiah 46, verse 4, Even to your old age and gray hairs, I am He. I am He that will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. Now, did you catch the repeated combination of the pronouns I, He? In the phrase, I am he. Now, here's where I want us to pay careful attention. Because I need to give a little language lesson, just a little language lesson, related to the pronouns I and he. Now, in the Hebrew, the word for I is ani. Ani. The Hebrew word for he, the pronoun he, is who. And so, ani who literally means I, he. Ani who is what we find in the Isaiah verses we read earlier. Translated for us as I am he, with the inserted am to just make sense of the English. I am he. Now, when the Hebrew Bible was translated to the common language of that day, the Greek language, the translators uniformly translated ani who as ego eimi. And ordinarily, ego eimi would be translated as I, I am, or I am. But because of the connection of ani who and ego eimi, most English translations would translate ego eimi as I am he. This time with the implied he inserted. I am he. Now, here's the point of all that, and it is the most single important information for us to grasp. And when we grasp it, we finally will hear who Jesus thinks he is. On the Sabbath of the Feast of the Tabernacles, remember this is an eighth-day celebration, the Levite priest would sing the so-called Song of Moses. The Song of Moses was recorded in Deuteronomy 32. And the peak of that song is verse 39, where we hear God speak, See now that I myself, literally, I, I am he, there is no God besides me. I put to death and I bring to life and so on and so forth. See now that I myself am he. And the Hebrew for I myself am he is ani Ani who? In the translated Old Testament in the Greek, it is ego, ego, eimi. And at the time of Jesus, these pronouns have become what's known as the divine pronouns. They were understood to be the inclusive summary of God's self revelation, of God's self declaration in the ritual of the Feast of Tabernacles. It was this great rabbi, Rabbi Hillel the Elder, who used to say in reference to this feast, when Ani is here, when I is here, all is here. When Ani is not here, who then is here? At one point during the feast, a choir of priests would sing at the altar, God is in his temple. God is in his temple. And then one of the priests would respond using the psalm, Be still and know that I am God. And then a choir of priests would respond and chant again and again, Ani, Ani, who? Ani, Ani, who? Ego, Ego, Amy. Ego, Ego, Amy. I, I am he. I, I am he. Be still and know that I am God. Ani, 
Ani, who, Ani, Ani, who, back and forth, back and forth. At the Feast of Tabernacles, along with images of water and light, the words of Ani, who, were reverberating in the minds and hearts of the Jewish worshipers as they anticipated the real presence of Adonai, who is the creator. They were expecting that God would show up any moment now. <laughs> now we're ready to hear Jesus speaks for himself. John tells us that after John, Jesus made the claim, I am the light of the world, the Jewish people, the religious authorities, got into an intense debate with him. Jesus says that he will soon be going away and that they will search for him and not find him and will end up dying in their sins. And Jesus says to them, you are from below. <laughs> what sort of a thing anybody would say, right? You are from below. I am from above. You are from this world. I am not of this world. It's pretty startling thing to say for anybody. But he didn't stop there. He continues, I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am he. Psh! Huge explosions. Bigger than Nagasaki and Hiroshima combined. If you do not believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. Did you see that? Did you hear Jesus? I am he, I, he, ego, a me, ani, who. The Jewish people, the authorities definitely heard Jesus and heard him loud and clear. This carpenter from backward village of Nazareth had just said those sacred pronouns of God, of God's self-revelation, of God's self-declaration during the feast that celebrates God's presence. And he said them in reference to himself. And I think John kind of watered down the Jewish people's response to them. They said, who are you? I think they said an equivalent of, who the hell are you? Right? Who are you, Jesus? <laughs> Come on, man. You can't just stop at I hear you. have to finish what you're trying to say. And John tells us there was more debate taking place. And Jesus says, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, and the Son of Man is his favorite way of speaking about himself. And lifted up means referring to him being lifted up on the cross to die. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that ego a me, that ani who, that I am he. Ego Amy, Ani, who, the very words by which Adonai, Yahweh, the Almighty, the one and only, chooses to be known to Israel. And this man from Galilee, from Nazareth, the son of Mary, dares to say, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. When you have lifted me up on the cross, you will realize that I am he, that ego a me. Now, you can understand then why the debate intensifies. They start accusing Jesus as being possessed by a demon. You are nuts, and you're possessed by the devil. And then towards the end of the argument, Jesus says, your father, Abraham, actually rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it, and he was glad. And the people he was debating with probably would say cynically to him, you're not even 50. You're what, what, 30? You're still a youngin', right? And you claim to have seen Abraham? And then another explosion. Jesus just took the bat and hit a home run. The magnitude of his tabernacle claim. I tell you the truth. Amen, amen. Very truly I tell you, he answered. Before Abraham was born, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. 
Pay attention that he didn't say, before Abraham was born, I was. In the past tense. But I am. That he is beyond time. He is past, present, and future. Before Abraham was, I am. And Jesus tells us that immediately the people he was debating would pick up stones to throw at him. Why? Why throw a stone at the person who heals you? Why throw stones at a person who loves you the way no one has ever loved you? Well, they're good Jewish people. So they had to. They had to. Because right in the middle of the feast that celebrates yod Hey, vav Hey, adonai the living God dwelling among his people, Jesus of Nazareth dares to say, Ani hu. Ego Amy. A few months later, at another feast, this time the feast of dedication, or known as Hanukkah, the people again would take up stones to throw at Jesus. And Jesus responded, I've shown you many good works from the Father. From which of these do you stone me? And as good Jewish people, they said, we're not stoning you for any good work but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claimed to be God. (laughs) And that is what precisely this carpenter from Nazareth had done on the Feast of Tabernacle. I am he. Adonai is none other than me, he says. yod He vau He is me. Of course, it's difficult to take. And the implication of his claim are literally endless. And throughout the centuries, for 2,000 years, we're still trying to figure that out. It's endless and it's staggering. But so that we will leave this place early enough for a good dinner, let me just point out three implications as I close. Wow, we are closing early. First, In light of Jesus' claim during this Feast of Tabernacle, we understand why he can make all the other claims that he makes. If he says, I am he, if he says, I am, then of course he can be, I am the bread of life. Of course he can say, I am the resurrection and the life. Of course, The I am he can say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Of course, he has the right to say, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Of course, he can say, I am the light of the world. Of course, he can say, I am the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me, live in me, because apart from me, it's hopeless. You can do nothing. And he's right. He's absolutely right. Of course, he can say to us that he's absolutely necessary for human life. Because this person is the very ground of all our being. Without him, we will simply cease to exist. We simply cannot live. Second implication. In light of Jesus' claim during this Feast of Tabernacle, it gives him every right to walk into our lives and interrupt it, interrupt our plans, interrupt our way of looking at the future. He has every right to command us, to command us and say, come to me, follow me, lose your life for me. But guess what? If you lose your life for me, you will live. And because he is Anihu, because he says, I am he, because he's Adonai, it is perfectly in his right to say that to us. And given who he thinks he is, we would be crazy not to obey. We are crazy not to come, not to follow, not to lose our lives for him crazy. 
In light of Jesus' claim during this feast, we see then why life is so miserable when we do not do it according to his way. When we fall from the way of the one true human being. And so the only rational, the only sensible, the only logical thing to do is to surrender to the center of everything. He is from the beginning. Nothing was created if it was not for him. He is the center of everything, the giver of life. And it is the only thing that is logical, sensible, and rational to do. To surrender ourselves to the center of everything. There is no room for lukewarm, mediocre response to Jesus. If Jesus is in fact who he thinks he is, then he is worthy of our impassioned worship. He is worthy of our impassioned love. He is worthy of our impassioned allegiance. That goes first before any kind of allegiance. That goes in all and every sector of our lives. That will actually make all of our allegiances make sense. It all has to be grounded in our allegiance to the center of being. Thirdly, in light of Jesus' claim during this feast, this feast celebrates God's presence, God dwelling among his people, we now know and we can understand why the good news of Jesus, why the gospel of Jesus is the greatest news anyone can ever hear. The word who became flesh and made his dwelling among us, who shown his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth, is the same who said, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I am the first and I am the last. I am the living one. I was dead, but now look, I am alive forever and ever. And not only that I am alive, here's the key to death. Here's the key to hell. Here's the key to Hades. And I hold it. I have control of death and Hades, and I hold it with an outstretched arm, with the nail-pierced hands. The I am He is the one who cried out, it is finished. It's finished. There's nothing more to add. And because He's the Alpha and Omega and the first and the last, we, his followers, we don't have to walk in darkness. We don't have to walk in darkness about the will of God. We don't have to walk in darkness about what it means to be human. He leads us out of the darkness into the light of God, who could be blinding at first, but actually lighting all of our dark crevices and bringing life into it, into the light of God's purposes. He, he opens up God's great plans for us and opens up the way to walk into those plans. But there's one thing that I want you to do, he says. There's one thing that I want you to do. I want you to take some risks. You have to take some risk. He does that by asking us to take risk. If we dare to take risk and follow him into deeper intimacy with him, he promises that we will experience more and more inner cleansing, more and more inner healing. And we will finally not walk in darkness about what it means to be fully human. There's no place for our faith for this escapism. Our faith is very earthy. 
until we meet Jesus face to face and he ushers in the new creation, the new Jerusalem, new heaven and earth. Our faith is very earthy. And that means all of us to live our lives as fully human. The great I am also calls himself, himself our brother. And as our brother, he wants us to be more like him. If you do not believe that I am he, you will indeed not become human anymore. You will indeed become less than human. You will indeed die in your sins. That's what it means. If we don't believe that I am he, he wants to take away anything Anything that keeps us from being like Jesus, from being fully human, from being the true image bearer of the living God. And that's great news. That is really, really good news. And as we wait for his advent, for his physical return, he promised to us that he will be present in his spirit. And because he's present in his spirit, you and I can be present physically to one another. That is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. To be present as Jesus physically to our brothers and sisters, especially those who need a touch, a physical touch from the one true human. Until we see him face to face, he says, greater things you will see, you do, because I have returned to the Father and I have poured out my Holy Spirit for you. And so as we enter into the Christmas season, as we enter the second week of Advent, let's live in continuous expectation that we can be present physically to one another. And that is what the world needs. What the world needs now is me physically present and you physically present. You know that song? Not play like that, right? <laughs> He's coming back. Amen. Physically. But before he does that, we are to be physically present to one another with joyous expectation that he will come back. Come, Lord Jesus, come.